Good morning and welcome to Worship Online with Wallace Memorial Baptist Church. We're so glad that you are tuned in this morning to worship the Lord together with us. If you are our guest this morning, we're really glad that you are watching with us as well. We'd ask if you wouldn't mind to take just a moment uh, to grab your cell phone and text the word welcome to the number 865-234-3241. We'll send you back a text, and we just want to get to know you and to get to know your family, to know how we can connect with you, how we can walk alongside you in your journey with the Lord. And so if you go ahead and text the word welcome to that number on the screen, uh, we'll be glad to reach out to you. As we begin worship today, we want to prepare our hearts to meet with the Lord, and uh, we're going to do that by spending a moment in a word of prayer. So if you will bow your heads with me this morning as we begin. Our God in heaven, we are grateful that, Lord, you meet with us, that you are Emmanuel, God, with us, and that even right now, Lord, you are present in our homes, even in this sanctuary, Lord, as we prepare to, to gather and to meet with you, to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts today, Lord, that you would show us our need for Jesus as our Savior. Lord, that you would grow us in our walk with him. And Lord, that you would move in a mighty way uh, through your church and through this service. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to say happy Memorial Day to you this weekend as you are celebrating uh, the freedoms that we have in our nation. Don't forget to remember those who have sacrificed so much so that we can experience all these freedoms. And our prayers go out to all the families who have lost loved ones in service to our country.
As we continue in worship, we want to move into a time of giving of our tithes and offerings and uh, want to celebrate today uh, as we have surpassed our Annie Armstrong Easter offering goal. All the money that's given to the Annie Armstrong uh, Easter offering goes to support our North American Mission Board and to support church plants and church planters all across North America. And uh, our, goal, our church set a goal for $55,000, and we have surpassed $58,000 this last week. Uh, and that's just a testimony of your faithfulness in giving uh, all throughout this pandemic. And uh, we thank you for giving to this special offering to support the work of the kingdom all over North America. As we prepare our hearts for a time of worship through giving, I want to remind you that this is your opportunity to give uh, online on our website. Uh, you can give by texting the word GIVE to the number 865-234-3241, or you can go ahead and, and grab your cash or your check and put it in an envelope and prepare to, to mail it into the church office or bring it by the church office this week. Uh, but this is our opportunity to return a portion of how God has blessed us. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your blessings in our lives. And Lord, we celebrate, Lord, the being able to participate in, in church planting all over uh, North America through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And we're thankful for the faithfulness of your people to continue to give week after week. Uh, even during this time of uncertainty. And we just pray your blessings uh, on the gifts and those who are giving, Lord, to, to further your kingdom in our city and all around the world. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The past several months have been difficult for a lot of us for a lot of different reasons. But one group in particular that's been affected most by this COVID-19 crisis has been the class of 2020, our graduating seniors. And the last week was a difficult week for a lot of our seniors because it would have been the week that they would have gotten to walk across that stage and receive their diploma. And so we wanted to be able to brighten their day uh, and to make it a little better. So we loaded up the van uh, and surprised each of them with a special gift. And here's what happened. I will believe 
for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of jesus i will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all agree there's no power like the power of jesus i will believe for greater things there's no power like the power of jesus let faith arise let all
During this pandemic, many people have taken to binge watching TV shows. In fact, many of us have probably watched way more TV than we would care to admit. But The Last Dance has been must watch TV over the last several weeks. It's a 10 part documentary on the Chicago Bulls, the team that won six world championships during the 1990s and the leader of the Chicago Bulls, the greatest of all time, the GOAT, is Michael Jordan. Advertising campaigns during the 90s urged little boys and little girls to be like Mike, and many of them aspired to be like him. He had international fame, he had enormous wealth because of his skills in the game of basketball. But until the release of this documentary, Many people, most people, really didn't know Michael Jordan. We saw all of his games, we saw all the accomplishments, but we didn't know the real Michael Jordan, who he was deep inside. And this documentary has offered viewers a window into who he is, into what makes him tick. And what we've seen is that there's more to Michael Jordan than meets the eye. In our passage this morning, a Samaritan woman encounters Jesus at a well. To her, it was just another day, and Jesus was just another guy. But what she learned on this day is that there was much more to Jesus than meets the eye. If you have your Bibles this, turn, this morning, turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 4. We're going to continue through our series called On the Mountains, and we're looking at significant moments, significant events in the life and ministry of Jesus. And this encounter that we're going to study today is one of the more memorable encounters in the life and ministry of Christ, where he meets this Samaritan woman at the well. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be at John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. 
he had to travel through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket and the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. But Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. As we think about this passage of scripture today and study the story of the woman at the well, I want us to, to gain a, a greater understanding of this good news, this gospel that Jesus presents to this woman. And the first thing that we see in our passage today is that the, this is a gospel that seeks. It's a gospel that seeks. Our God is a missionary God. He is a sending and a seeking God. When you look at the very opening pages of Scripture, we see that God created man to have fellowship with him, to have a relationship with him. But because of our sin, man has disrupted that fellowship with God. But ever since that first sin, God has been seeking after man. In Genesis chapter 3 and verses 8 and 9, the Bible says, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So the Lord God called out to the man and said to him, where are you? You see God seeking Adam, seeking to restore this broken fellowship, even at the very beginning of mankind. God made a promise to Adam and to Eve that he would send to them a, a savior from the seed of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. And as you read through the Old Testament, it tells us of the unfolding of this story, the unfolding of this promise from God. As you get through the Old Testament, God is seeking after his people, sending judges, sending prophets, sending those who would call them back into relationship with him. And when you arrive at the New Testament, it begins with the announcement of the Messiah by the angels. That God had sent his own son to save us. That God is seeking after us. Here we see, an, an in, see it in an individual sense. God is seeking after this Samaritan woman. Jesus interacts with her and in verse 9 she she asks him how is it that you a, a jew is asking for a drink from me a samaritan woman for jews do not associate with samaritans and so you can see even from her from her response that this is this is an, an unusual encounter that takes place but the place where this interaction occurred is significant in verse 5, it tells us that Jesus came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. So this is a special Old Testament location. If you go back to the book of Genesis in chapter 33, verses 18 through 20, it says, After Jacob came from Paddan Aram, he arrived safely at Shechem in the land of Canaan. And he camped in front of the city. He purchased a section of the field where he had pitched his tent from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of silver. And he set up an altar there, and he called it God, the God of Israel. And so you see this, 
where this piece of land originally came from, that Jacob had purchased it when he came into the promised land, that he had set up an altar for worship there, for worship of the true God, the God of Israel. When you get to the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse 32, we're told that Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up from Egypt, were buried here at Shechem in the parcel of land that Jacob had purchased from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, for a hundred pieces of silver. It was an inheritance for Joseph's descendants. The great patriarch Jacob, Jacob's well, is located here. In fact, if you look in verse 20 of John chapter 4, this woman tells Jesus, our fathers worshipped on this mountain. And so this is a, a, a special place. It's a place where God has met with his people in times past. And it's a place where he's meeting with them again at this present moment. Because God the Son has come down and he is seeking to save that which is lost. This entire scenario it would have been strange according to all the common customs of the day. Oftentimes the Jews went all the way around Samaria altogether when they were traveling back and forth from Jerusalem up to Galilee because of the hatred and the animosity between the two groups of people. They would usually go down through the old Jericho Road over to the Jordan River Valley and they would go north up around Samaria and back over into Galilee. But Jesus instead is going straight through Samaria. And even when the Jews would pass through Samaria, they, they often wouldn't stop or they wouldn't, they wouldn't interact with the Samaritans. They didn't want to have this sort, of, uh, this sort of interaction with people that they considered to be unclean and to be unworthy. But Jesus stopped. And he not only stopped, but he spoke with a Samaritan. And he not only spoke with with a Samaritan, but he spoke with a Samaritan woman. And he not only spoke with a Samaritan woman, but he spoke with a Samaritan woman with a bad reputation. In fact, when you look at verse 27 in John chapter 4, when the disciples returned from going to try and find food, it says when they arrived, they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you want or why are you talking with her? This, this interaction was so, was so unusual that his disciples were shocked that Jesus was talking with her when they got back. But what this interaction shows us is that there is accessibility to Christ for all groups of people. That there is accessibility to Christ for men and for women. That there is accept, uh, accessibility to Christ for people with good reputations and for people with bad reputations. That this gospel really is for everybody. It's even for, for you this morning. It's good news. You may be just like this woman. You might not have a good reputation. You might be the sort of person that people try to avoid in life. But I want you to know that Jesus loves you. That Jesus is seeking after you. That he desires to save you. From your sin. Because this is a gospel that seeks. The second thing that we see in our passage of scripture today. Is that it's a gospel that saves. This conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Is filled with imagery and with, with meaning. On the surface it appears to be a discussion about water. Getting water out of a well. But for those with eyes to see and with ears to hear, there is so much more that's going on here in this passage of Scripture. Jesus asks the woman for a drink from the well. And we see that she's surprised that he's speaking to her, that she's a Samaritan. But in verse 10, Jesus responds saying, If you knew the gift of God and who is saying to you, give me a drink, then you would ask him. And he would give you living water. Now this is a, a strange remark from Jesus. 
If you grew up in church and, and have been around Christians for, for a long time, you've probably heard the term living water and maybe heard it many times before. But this is an unusual phrase for Jesus to say. What does he mean by living water? I mean, does Jesus have access to, to better water somewhere? Does he have a, a pipeline to some high quality H2O? In verse 11 and 12, she says to him, Sir, you don't even have a bucket. The well is deep. So where do you get this living water that you're talking about? You're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well. He drank from it himself, as did his sons and, and his livestock. And so this woman is skeptical of Jesus at this point. Who does he, who does he think he is? I mean, you, you don't even have a bucket. Where are you going to get this water from? You're not greater than our, our father Jacob, are you? Are you, the, are you the goat? Are you the greatest of all time? I mean, where are you going to get this water from? And who Jesus is, that's what she was getting at. Who, who do you think you are? Who Jesus is, is a crucial question. What the woman didn't know is that he was greater than Jacob. He was Jacob's God. That Jesus did possess a living water. And he says to her in verse 14, Whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water that's springing up in him for eternal life. And so Jesus is obviously not speaking about water here. He's talking about life. He's talking about salvation it's a reminder of an Old Testament prophecy from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55. In Isaiah 55, in verse 1, the Bible says, Come, everyone who's thirsty, come to the water. And you without silver, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Why do you spend silver on what's not food? Your wages on what doesn't satisfy. But listen carefully to me and eat what's good and you'll enjoy the choicest of, fruit, of foods. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you'll live. I'll make a permanent covenant with you on the basis of the faithful kindnesses of David. I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. So you'll summon a nation you don't know. And nations who do not know you will run to you. For the Lord your God even the Holy One of Israel has glorified you. He says there's going to be one who's going to come. He's going to draw the nations to himself. He's going to come and give you water without cost that will satisfy your thirsts. Who is Jesus? This is the question that we all have to understand because the answer makes all the difference in the world. See, Jesus is God the Son. He is holy and He is righteous. He is the Messiah who was sent to save mankind from her sin. He's the sacrificial lamb who made payment for our sin. He's the resurrected king who conquered death for everyone who would believe in him. He is the resurrection and the life who gives living water that springs up to eternal life life. As Jesus is talking with this woman, she says to him in verse 19, Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. She's acknowledging that there's something special about him. There's something different about him that he, he knew about her past. She, he has to be some sort of, of a prophet, but Jesus is much more than a prophet. In verse 25, the woman says to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. And when he comes, he'll explain everything to us. But Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. And here we come to the heart of the matter. I am he, Jesus said. I am the Messiah, Jesus says. And who Jesus is matters. See, the Bible tells us that we have to 
repent or turn of our sin and express our faith in this Jesus as our Messiah. He, we have to believe in Him, that He will be our Savior who will save us from our sins. And if we trust in Jesus as the Savior, we will be forgiven. We will be cleansed from all unrighteousness. And we will receive this living water in our hearts that will spring up to eternal life with God forever. See, this is a gospel that saves the third thing that we see in our passage today is that it's a gospel that satisfies. And the thing about the gospel is that it really is good news. That's what the word gospel means. It means good news. It's, it's the best news that we could ever hear. So that when, when, we're, when we are confronted with the gospel, we should eagerly desire it and eagerly accept it in our hearts because this good news saves us. It changes us. It makes us new. It satisfies. Notice what happened in this woman's life. As Jesus is interacting with her there by the well, he tells her to go call her husband and, and come on back and talk to him. And she sort of says, ah, well, Jesus, I don't really have a husband right now. And he says to her in verse 18, you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you said is true. And so what we, what we learn about this woman is that her condition wasn't very good. She's been in and out of relationships for her entire life. In fact, she's been married five times and is living with a different guy now. And so everyone in Sikar would have, would have known about this woman. She's the woman that most people would have avoided and who would have shunned. Her life has been a series of, of, of bad decisions one after another. She's been searching for something in her heart. Searching for something that would satisfy, something that would fill the hole that was there. Maybe it could be this husband. Maybe it would be that husband. Maybe it could be another husband. Maybe it's this other guy. She was searching, obviously, for something that was missing in her life. Maybe if I enter into another relationship, then I can find happiness. But Jesus confronted the sin that was in her life. And he exposed the emptiness of this sin. The same is true in, in our lives. The, the Holy Spirit convicts us of, of our sin and, and we feel guilty of our wrongdoings. We feel burdened by these wrong decisions. We feel ashamed of our shortcomings. Just like Adam and Eve hid in the garden after they had sinned, it was because they were ashamed. And we feel the same way because of the sin in our lives and how we're separated from God because of it. Maybe you have a testimony that's similar to this Samaritan woman. Maybe your story has different sins, but the same sort of results. You feel stuck in the chains of your sin. You keep searching and grasping for something that would satisfy, something that would fill the emptiness within. But there's hope. See, because the work of the Holy Spirit and our hearts is to point us to our Savior, is to point us to the truth that our sin is never going to satisfy. It's never going to give us what we really need. It's only going to leave us broken and hurt and empty inside. The Holy Spirit points us to Jesus who mends us and heals us and fills us. Jesus who gives us living water so that we don't ever thirst again. On this day, the Samaritan woman came to Jacob's well looking for water, but what she found instead was, was a living water. If you look down in verse 28 of John chapter 4, it says the woman left her water jar. She didn't even bring the water with her. And she went into town. She told the people, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? 
And they left the town and made their way to him. You see, this woman's life was changed forever on that day. She tells everyone in town about Jesus. She shared about how he, how he had redeemed her. And the entire village heard the gospel. And many others responded as well. In fact, in verse 39, it says, Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of what he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we've heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. They recognize that Jesus really is who we need. What about you today? Maybe you realize that you need this gospel in your heart. This is a gospel that, that seeks after you. God loves you and desires to have a relationship with you. This is a gospel that, that saves. I want you to know that you can be forgiven of your sins, that you can be washed clean and made right with God because of what Jesus did for you. This is a gospel that satisfies only through a relationship with Christ can you realize the purpose and the meaning of your life. All these other things that we chase after, all these other things that we try to fill that void and that emptiness with, leave us empty and hollow. But Jesus really is who we need. So this morning, if this is a decision that, that you're contemplating, as the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart today, I want to encourage you right now to grab your phone and text the word DECIDE to the number 865-234-3241. We want to send you a text and, and let you know about what it means to know Jesus and to follow after him, for him to be the savior of your heart. Leave a, leave a comment there in the comments below so that we can know how to connect with you, how to pray for you as you begin this relationship with Christ in your heart. Christians, today, this story on the mountain reminds us of how important this good news really is. This gospel sought after us. It saved us. It satisfies us. And are we living out this gospel every day? Are we seeking satisfaction in, in sin that's going to leave us empty when we have living water instead? Maybe there are things in your life that you recognize that you need to turn from or repent of today. Are we sharing this living water with others just like the Samaritan woman who ran into town to tell everybody, you won't believe what I found. You won't believe what's happened to me today. Christians, are we sharing about this living water that's transformed our lives? So today, let's celebrate this good news that God has given to us. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time in your word today. And I pray, Lord, for any that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, that today, that as they hear the gospel, as the Holy Spirit works in their heart, Lord, that they will respond in, in faith. That they'll trust in Jesus as their Savior. That they will today receive this living water that springs up in them to eternal life. God, I pray for Christians that have already made this decision before in their lives, but maybe are trying to find satisfaction in, in lesser things, that they would realize what they have, that this is the living water that makes us to never thirst again. Lord, that, that we would be like the Samaritan woman who tells others and tells everyone that she knew about this Messiah who had met her and who had changed her. That we would be, Lord, sharing about this living water with our friends, with our family, with our co-workers, with our neighbors. So God, move in our hearts during this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey, this morning before you log off, we want to say thank you uh, for watching and worshiping with us today. There's just a few announcements that we want to make uh, to make sure that you are aware of. The first is that if you have children, our kids worship, Wallace Kids Worship will be on their YouTube channel in just a few minutes at 11 a.m. So make sure that you tune in for that. If you are looking for uh, an opportunity to, to learn more, to grow deeper in your walk with Christ, we will have online Catalyst tonight at 5 p.m. So make sure that you are tuned in on Facebook and on our YouTube uh, to see about Wallace Catalyst Online. Uh, and then lastly, this is a reminder that next Sunday, May the 31st, On Campus Worship will return. Uh, you saw this announcement uh, last week that we're going to have three services offered, one at 8 a.m., one at 9.30 a.m., one at 11 a.m. They'll all be identical services, uh, and you are instructed to go to the, the hour of worship that you would typically go to connect groups. And so you'll see this upcoming week more instructions on our social media, on our website, and in our newsletter that's going to be sent to your house about what that worship's going to look like and, and how to be prepared as you come to worship and which service that you should go to. Uh, so make sure that you are tuned in to all of those outlets to be up to date with all the news that's coming out about on-campus worship. So you've heard your mission for today. You are now sent to Knoxville and the nations. <laughs>